Okay, everyone. What's up, Goldie here? And I'm going to be going over the um, six-game main slate we have here on Monday, June 26. Um, cool little slate here, I think, today. we It's a Strider day, right? Um, and he gets a really good matchup here against Minnesota, who has been terrible uh, over the last month. Um, some good arms outside of him, though. Uh, I mean, do you want to consider Verlander a, a good arm still? I don't know. Um, but at a very playable price tag down here on DK at 8300 naturally. Seeing a lot of ownership here so far. Um, but, of course, Strider leading the way 12-6, right? He's not cheap here. Um, and I, I really love that DK did this today. Jack the price of this guy up so you don't see him at you know, the 85, 90% in tournaments, um, and you just got to eat it. I, I like that they've done this, uh, made him super expensive, and that at least allows for some decision points, you know, to creep up, and we can hopefully take advantage of some other spots. You know, we don't have to play Strider because, well, he's 12-6. Uh, you probably are going to, you know, if you're building a lot of teams, you're going to, of course, want to get to a lot of him. Look at this projection delta. We've talked about this a couple of times on the season with him. Um, when the projection is number one this high, this is 26 points. This is monstrous. Um, he's also leading the way in value, right? Even at this price tag, um, it, it makes it super difficult to get off of this because the opportunity cost when we get down to short slates like this, is so, so high. He could pop for 40 uh, pretty much every time he steps on the mound, and definitely in this matchup. You know, Minnesota's been striking out a lot this season, um, and over the last month, their offense has been pretty poor, to say the least. Um, so it makes it difficult when the projection is this high to come off of this. Um Thankfully, the, the price is high, and that drops the ownership down. You know, if he were 10-6, for example, uh, you'd see this number at, at 65%, probably. Um, so, all of that spiel aside, it, it, like, it makes it super difficult when the, the projection delta between um, Strider and all of these other guys is so large. I mean, we're talking 10 points between... <laughs> Cease and 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 Detmers down here, for example, and Strider up at the top. Um, that's a that's a, absolutely monstrous. So you're gonna want to get to him if you can. But that said, if you can't make this happen, there are some offenses. You know, we've got some attackable arms down here, like Matt Boyd. Uh, he gets Texas on the other side. Not sure we're gonna be wanting to get it, get to a lot of Matt Boyd necessarily. Trevor Williams has awful numbers. He gets Seattle tonight. They're probably going to be pretty popular. Colin Ray has been um, very attackable, right? Ever outside of a, a couple of starts where he's been serviceable. Still gives up a lot of contact here. We'll get into him. Um, with a low strikeout team over here in the Mets, I think that's a pretty decent tournament spot to target as well. Brandon Williamson can't throw a pass to anybody. He gets Baltimore. There should be some runs scored in this Baltimore-Cincinnati game tonight. You know, so we are naturally going to want to get to some um, some expensive stacks, right? Seattle, not so expensive. Um, in aggregate, Mets, not so expensive. But Baltimore and Cincinnati, I mean, Cincinnati, certainly expensive. If you want to go after Cole Irvin, Baltimore, there's a couple of expensive pieces. Um, so we'll see what they all these guys want to do. A lot of teams now going really, really heavy on the platoons. So some of these guys, like a Cedric Mullins, for example, might not even be in the lineup because Baltimore called up a very high upside prospect uh, of theirs. Um, from the right side, they might want to give him a little bit of run tonight. In any case, um, that's kind of a, a brief breakdown, brief overview of where we are in the slate today. We've got some attackable price tags, right? Heaney gets Detroit here in the mid-range, seeing 25% naturally. Cease at a very cheap price tag, even though he's been um, 
underwhelming all season. 7,700 for him. Also seen about 20%. Same thing with Detmers, right? So it's basically going to be these top two guys, Luis Castillo getting a really good suppression matchup in Washington tonight. Um, in Seattle, he's only seen about 25%. So this is a pretty damn good spot, too. He's very expensive for him at 11,000. But again, it's just uh, relative to the other guys, it's still a very playable price tag and a, and a playable spot. Um, so we've got plenty of decision points, at least on the mound that we can make. And that's really kind of where we want to start when we go over all of the games. Um, and then we can sort of filter that down to see what kind of arms we're most comfortable attacking. And that's hopefully where we can, uh, you know, d direct all of our, our teams and our builds toward, um, with our, our offenses in the box. And both of these arms here in Baltimore tonight with Cincinnati and the Orioles are very much attackable. So, as I mentioned, we'll probably want to try and get to some offense here. Um, Red's very expensive. Brandon Williamson, not so much. He's 5300 on the mound. This price tag is going to put him in play because this is a six-game slate. And you've only got 12 arms to choose from on DK and you got to play two of them. So if you get up to a strider 12, six, right. And I mean, it's going to be hard to squeeze in, uh, both strider and Luis Castillo, for example, uh, I haven't even tried to build one of those teams yet, but you spend 23 K on your arms like that. It's not easy, right? You gotta, you gotta really go uh, scrape in the bottom of the barrel, um, with your hitters. Brandon Williamson might be a little tough for me to get there tonight. Mostly it's because of the combination here. He's pitching to a, a decent bit of contact, 17% K rate, right? Not throwing it past a lot of guys, but it's a 13.5% barrel rate. That really has me worried here. He's got five pitches, which is attractive, right? And a 5,300 price tag on a six-game slate with a five-pitch arsenal. Uh, that just naturally has to put him in play. Um Still a pretty short season or short sample this season with Brandon Williamson. Had a couple of difficult low strikeout matchups, right? Colorado a couple of times, right? Um, et cetera. And just 36 and two thirds here. But even with some difficult strikeout matchups, you should probably want to see this a little bit higher to be considering going after Baltimore. They're going to go very right handed heavy. As I mentioned, they're calling up one of their top middle infield prospects, Jordan Westberg, tonight. See if he's going to be in the lineup. This is a super attackable spot, right? Because Brandon Williamson, of over 130 right-handed hitters he's seen this season, 250 average allowed. It's not a bad number there. 366 Wobo, we're starting to get a little elevated. 293 ISO, certainly that's elevated, right? 070 ground ball to fly ball, give or take. 22% line drive rate with 34% hard contact. So a lot of this contact to the right-handers is pretty loud and it's on a line right average exit velo to both sides 90 miles an hour here so very much attackable with right-handers we don't really i mean this 31 hitter sample against lefties is just kind of whatever too noisy to really take anything out of a 48 percent hard contact rate against lefties like you know we need to see that develop a little bit more and same thing with the right-handed sample of course Will these numbers come down? I mean, I don't know. We we do have large samples on some starting pitchers in platoons that are similar to these, you know, over um, the course of a full season, couple seasons worth. These numbers are absolutely sustainable, and they're not good. So certainly attackable with a lot of the right-handers over here from the birds. Uh, Austin Hayes, they'll probably have him up near the top of the lineup. Like I said, they may do some... You'll pull some shenanigans with like a Cedric tonight. Uh, historically, at least the last season or two, they've been shuffling him all the way down to the nine hole um, with a lefty on the mound. They may do that. They may just give him a break. He did just come off the DL a couple of days ago. So they might need to give him a breather a little bit, make sure he's uh, not going to tweak anything. So you could see an Austin Hayes up at the top. Rutch got a day off yesterday. He'll be back in there tonight. Um you know, high, high walk rate, really against both sides of the plate. 
good on base numbers. Not so much in the power necessarily from the right side, but still very playable. He's expensive, though, if you want to get to him. And he's really the only one above 5,000. So full Baltimore stacks here are very much in play. Santander is excellent from the right side, 4,400. It's a super playable price tag. And then you've got all of the kind of young guys, but they're all going to hit from the right side here. Uh, Ramon Urias, Aaron Hicks, not so young, uh, but is a switch hitter, technically. James McCann, he'll probably be back tonight. I think he's eligible to come off the DL. He had a sprained ankle. Um, so we'll see what they want to do there. He is a another cheap catcher piece at 3,000. Um, that is playable. He's got some pretty poor numbers this season since he's been hurt so much, but uh, he's at a playable price, definitely, and historically has hit left-handers very well. And then they'll likely have Westberg down. He's at the stone minute shortstop, so you got to make a choice between him and Georgie Mateo. 3300 that's a playable price for him. Finally, he's not up at the 5000 or whatever. Well, he's been dreadful over the last you know month plus. And that makes full Orioles stacks very much in play here because they're going to go super right-handed heavy. Um and you've got a, a couple of switch hitters here that you can mix in as well. So I think going after Brandon Williamson is probably pretty warranted. This hard contact figure at 34%, while not super elevated, I mean, this is a, a respectable sample here. And as I mentioned, a lot of this contact is really on a line here, and it's pretty solid. So I think that puts the Orioles in a really intriguing uh, batted ball matchup here against Williamson because he's not going to throw past him just the 17% K rate. He is pretty efficient, right? Gets ahead of hitters, but it's just that command and location uh, of all of the pitches deeper in the count lead to this high barrel rate and all of the contact. So I think he's very much attackable here. Um, and we should probably see some, some runs on the board from Baltimore. On the other side, they got Cole Irvin going for them. 5,000. Once again, this price tag is going to put him in play. Uh, the matchup, not so much. All right, Reds against lefties. Number's going to continue to tick up. They're at 100 WRC plus at the moment. And this has ticked up a, a, a few clicks over the last couple of weeks with all of these young kids getting healthy. Um, notably, like a, a, a Johnny India, who has had a, a really good couple of weeks. Right, Matt McLean's been in there every day since they brought him up. Um, they did just get Joey Votto back. Now, We'll see what they want to do. They did pinch hit for him last night uh, against a lefty. So they may be starting to play some platoon shenanigans with Joey Votto. Um, but Nick Senzel is healthy, at least at the moment. And they can go very right-handed heavy themselves. Kevin Newman, um, Ellie Dela Cruz, of course, hitting from both sides. Spencer Steer has been great against lefties really all season. Now, these guys are expensive, far more expensive than Baltimore. 47 for Matt McLean, 5K for India, 5,800 for Ellie is pretty stiff to say the least. Um, the right side, certainly not his best side, but this is Cole Irvin. He's generally not going to wow us with stuff necessarily. So far in his short sample, uh, he's been kind of up and down between AAA and, uh, and the big league club this season. It's a little noisy here, but just a 21.5% K rate. Has never been a large strikeout figure arm anyway. Um, but certainly not going to wow. Definitely not with velocity or anything like that. Just sitting 90-93 give or take on the fastball mix. 87 with the cutter. 84 mile an hour change. It's a fine delta there. He's always been um, you know, given up a, a good bit of contact. He pitches to a lot, right? 82%. But for the most part, historically, it hasn't been overly loud. Now, this season, like, they had to send him down, uh, try and get him right, try and get him healthy, because he was giving up a lot of real loud contact, 14.5% barrel rate, and it was mostly to the right side, of course. 321 average allowed, 408 Woba with a 272 ISO. So similar numbers to Brandon Williamson up here, 38% hard contact, a lot of fly balls as well, 050 ground ball to fly ball, big line drive rate, right? So these right-handers, uh, despite generally not having a lot of power themselves, just a 162 ISO in aggregate here, sneaky high line drive rate for a team, 22%. This is an upside spot, again, for the Reds. So if you want to get to some expensive Red stacks, but 
very viable red stacks for sure. Uh, I think they're very much in play on a short six-game slate here. Favorites would probably be Kevin Newman leading off. He's 2,800. He's got dual eligibility. It's kind of hard to ignore that. Ellie at 58 is super difficult, but, um, you know, definitely not my favorite play of the day at that particular price tag. And his weaker side is the right side for sure. Uh, If I had to choose a third base play from the Reds, it'd be Nick Senzel. He's 3,900. Not the greatest price tag necessarily there. Same thing with Spencer Steer at first base and outfield. 4,800 for him. All these guys have dual eligibility outside of Johnny India and like a Joey Votto um, or one of the guys behind the plate. That's really going to make the Reds very much stackable and easy to stack and easy to differentiate with. So um, if you want to get to Cincinnati, I think it's it's perfectly fine. Very high upside spot, certainly, if these righties can get to Cole Irvin. Uh, but once again, keep in mind that at these particular price tags for these arms, um, overall, you know, the Reds against lefties, right? Just at 100 WRC plus, that does put Cole Irvin in play to suppress, go maybe five innings, strike out three or four guys, just not get bludgeoned. That's in play. Brandon Williamson as well. He's a serviceable arm. This five-pitch arsenal is going to keep him in play, even though it's a far more difficult matchup against Baltimore. Much better numbers for them uh, against lefties than the Reds, for example. So both offenses certainly in play, less so on the on the pitchers, but um, the price tags put them in play definitely. Okay, let's move on to Milwaukee and the Mets. Um, interesting game here as well. Colin Ray on the mound, 5,600, cheap price tag against really what's a pretty terrible offense, top to bottom. Um, the Mets, uh, just a 103 WRC plus. They're going to walk a little bit at 9%. Not going to strike out a lot, but they're not going to hit the baseball over the wall or down a line in a gap or anything, and not going to hit for a lot of power. Just an average 150 ISO here. 32.5% hard is roughly average, slightly elevated. Semi-attractive there. Buck 15, ground ball to fly ball. This is okay, but mostly just average for the Mets. They just don't create. They've got one guy in the team that's stealing bases, and that's Starling Marte. And unfortunately, that's the only thing he's doing. He's not hitting for a lot of average, and his ISO is sitting at like 080 to both sides, right? So they don't create a lot of runs here. Um, Nimmo will swipe a bag here or there, but everybody else is not stealing, and they're not getting on base enough to really make this lineup overly threatening. So that puts Colin Ray in play, right? At 5,600, he has had some serviceable outings this year, where he's popped for 15, 18, 20 points. I think tonight on the mound, you might need a little bit more than that. We do have the aces going. Uh, But as an SP2, certainly a a price tag like this, if he could pop for 15 or 18 points at 5,600, I think that's a perfectly serviceable figure, and they could very well get you there in tournaments. Might not be enough to win, um, but... It can absolutely give you a chance and give you the opportunity to get to a more expensive offense. He does have a six-pitch mix himself, so this certainly puts him in play. And these serviceable outings have really been due mostly to the equitable fastball mix, right? He's, He's getting value relative to the rest of the field out of the fastballs, and he's very balanced here in his 12 starts. You know, he came up... Um, you know, got that first start against the Padres, and they weren't really sure what they were going to get out of him. And as a matter of fact, he's been incredibly durable, certainly with um, the likes of like a Brandon Woodruff having gone down and, and other question marks in their rotation. Colin Ray's been a uh, a really serviceable piece for them. So the off-speed and the braking stuff is leaving a little bit on the table. Sliders just break even. That's fine for the most part. Um, if you're only using it at 10%, this is a break-even pitch, and you don't need to really wow anybody with a 10% usage pitch. You do need some more, though, if you're going to uh, realize any upside out of your, you know, you need to use your secondary arsenal, I should say, uh, a little bit more, and you certainly need to get more value than giving up eight outs to the field on a split. Um, off... It, with your off-speed pitch, that is. So overall, the the breaking stuff, you know, giving up outs to the field and using it 20% of the time 
and then the split here at another 8 to 10% of the time, you know, giving up quite a lot of value. So that's how he's been mostly attackable. Um, but the 3x fastball mix here does put him in play against a pretty marginal offense overall. So if you land on a Colin Ray at super low ownership, um, it, it, if you're building a bunch of teams, that is, I, I don't think this is the worst thing in the world necessarily. He's been efficient early in the count, 62% strike one. And he's staying off of the barrel for the most part, not walking a lot of guys, you know, little susceptibility to the left-handers here or there, of course. And that's how we would mostly want to attack if we're going after Colin Ray, All right? 259 average allowed to the lefties in a respectable 125 hitter sample, 361 Woba elevated for sure with the 232 ISO definitely elevated there. Just a 20% strikeout rate, 075 ground ball to fly ball and a 35% hard contact. So, Certainly attackable, mostly with the lefties, but you can get to some of these righties as well. What would take me off of some of the righties, certainly from the Mets like a Tommy Pham or a Starling Marte, for example, they hit so many ground balls, and he gets 175 ground balls per fly ball from right-handers, right? 35% hard contact. We don't really care about that number necessarily when the ground ball rate is this high, north of 53%. Doesn't give up near as much production or power to the righties. So that puts him in play because uh, some of these lefties over here from the Mets aren't all that high upside. Danny Vogelbach doesn't strike out a lot, but really didn't have all that much power upside, nor does Jeff McNeil or Brett Beatty. A lot of these guys hit a lot of ground balls. Um, Brandon Nimmo, a little bit more on a line. He would he and, of course, Frankie Lindor would be my favorites from the left side if you go there. And you can always play Pete Alonzo, of course. Um, price tag-wise, these guys are going to pop pretty hard, the Mets over here. So that will put them in play. Uh, but I'm overall kind of lukewarm on that. If their ownership steams later on in the day and they see a bit too much love, I'm perfectly happy coming off of the Mets, not necessarily with shorting them on the other side playing Colin Ray or going out of my way to do that. But coming off of the Mets, I think, is a viable play because overall the offense is pretty poor, and this game is at City Field. Um, might have some some weather concerns to be aware of. Uh, I haven't dug deep into the weather for this game in particular um, just yet today, so keep an eye out for that if we've got any pop-up storms or, or anything like that. And that would take me off of even further uh, more offense and put me back onto more of the pitching, including Verlander on the other side for the Mets, 8,300 for him. I like the price tag and I'm still looking for Verlander to kind of start to round into form here a little bit. Um, now his last several starts of, let's put it this way. His last three starts, right? He looks to have maybe busted out of this every other game, uh, sort of pattern where he just gets drilled uh, and gives up four or five runs. And he seems to be perhaps rounding into form a little bit. Strikeout stuff starting to flatline uh, or normalize, I should say, um, to where we would like to see Verlander. Of course, in aggregate, just a 21% K rate this season and having a lot of trouble still throwing strike one. So this would take me off. He's got to be way more efficient than this in order for us to get excited. This is why he's struggling so much with the K stuff. It's because he can't get ahead in counts and he's elevating his own pitch count. So historically, what we've seen with Verlander is he's been able to go deep into games and even when he doesn't have his best strikeout stuff or even gives up a couple runs here or there due to being a fly ball pitcher and getting on the barrel sometimes, he's he's had depth in him. And he's still been efficient early in counts. And we're just not seeing that from Verlander so far this season. So overall, still looking for this attractive price tag to... Um, you know, give us a little bit of value for Verlander. And this is a fine matchup. Milwaukee's been terrible over the last month plus. Uh, their offense really all season been very underwhelming, more so against lefties, but they're bad against righties too. 87 WRC plus here, striking out at a 25% clip, hitting just 230, right? Average WOBA, but this number is about uh, 40 points lower in the last month uh, here in June. Power has dropped off a cliff as well. So the Brewers are very much attackable right now. The offense is pretty cold. So I think getting to Verlander once again is viable. 
Um, still waiting for the strikeout stuff to reappear. And for the contact number, certainly against right-handers, to drop off a little bit and normalize. He's never given up this much hard contact. He's pushing 40% to the righties right now. He's always been a fly ball pitcher and given up a little bit of pop and some homers, right? But it's never been this exaggerated. So I, st- I still think Verlander's kind of rounding into form just yet. And perhaps over the last couple of starts, starting to find it uh, a little bit more. The only thing we're going to have to manage with Verlander here is ownership, of course. And there are plenty of other guys in the mid-range that I think you can get off of. Do I want to short him with the Brewers? I mean, you can get leverage. This is a six-game slate. Like, go ahead. Um, But overall, it would probably just be like uh, Christian Yelich, Willie Adamas types. Um, Not super thrilled about a a William Contreras, although he's a fine catcher piece in the two-hole at 4,300. He's got plenty of pop, and Verlander is giving up pop to the right side this season. Overall, Contreras' numbers against right, he's not very good this year. Um, but he's at a, a playable price in a playable lineup spot. So that makes some, some short Brewer stacks, I think, certainly in play. If you want to go after Verlander and just bet on the fact that he's been dreadful and there's really nothing so far in these underlying metrics to suggest that that's going to turn around, um, then, yeah, by all means, six games late. Uh, I'm perfectly on board with getting some some deeper tournament uh, Brewer stacks, even viable in perhaps 20 max, getting off of this 33, 35% ownership on Verlander. So I think pretty much everything is in play, you know, less so in the Colin Ray, of course, but, um, you know, mostly Verlander and some of the Mets here. But overall, um, just kind of a meh game for me. Uh, and I think I'll probably, in my tournament builds, prefer to go elsewhere. I, despite the fact that the Mets are popping pretty hard so far. Okay, let's move on. Minnesota and Atlanta. Sonny Gray on the mound. It's a pretty good pitching matchup, to be quite honest. Now, Sonny Gray is expensive, 9,600, and their projection is quite low here at sub-13 points. Um, that's because he's getting Atlanta. Now, I think this is a little fishy. This this number does look a little bit low. There's a lot of variance with Sonny Gray, and when he starts spraying it a little bit, um, he quit striking guys out for whatever reason, and he pitches to a lot of contact, doesn't end up going deep into a lot of games. So he elevates his pitch count. He's not super efficient early in the count, right? Sub 60% strike one. He does have some walks in him, and that's been elevating the pitch count, and he's only been able to go five and a third every start. Now, he's been durable, of course, which is good. But throwing 90 pitches per and just five and a third, we need a little bit more out of that, uh, out of this 9,600 price tag than that, I should say. Um, now, we do still have some negative regression coming for Sonny's, but he was really, really good early in the season. I love the pitch mix, but the two-seamer value has kind of dropped off a cliff here um, compared to early season metrics. But everything else is is pretty okay. He's got a, a 20% usage on the two-seamer, and it's, and it's break-even. It's not like it's bad, necessarily. Um, and getting value out of a two-seamer overall, that's um, that's pretty respectable because it's generally not a very good pitch. But everything else, including the curveball at, at neutral value here, is fine. He's got six pitches that he's going to work with, um, and that makes Sunday Gray very serviceable. He's 5% owned here. Now, I don't like the price tag. I don't like the elevated walk rate pushing 10%. I don't like the fact that he gets Atlanta on the other side and that he's only going five and a third in a lot of good matchups, right? This is obviously a terrible matchup against one of the best offenses in baseball. We've got the negative regression coming in some fashion, whether it's in the strand rate, that's probably where it'll come, that will pop this realized ERA from 250 up to his expecteds at three and a three and three quarters, give or take. So about a run's worth of regression coming in those metrics at some point, um, probably going to come in walks and then circling, you know, letting guys circle the base pass. Very viable here with Atlanta because they hit the baseball over the wall. However, against righties, I mean, we talked about this over the last couple of weeks. They were a break-even offense, right, relative to the rest of the league in WRC+. Plus, They were at about 103, 105, 106, somewhere around there because the only guy that was actually creating runs for them in the lineup was Ronald Acuna, right? He gets on, he steals, and 
that allows for you know the, the guys at the in the two through five hole to hit with runners in scoring position and that really buoyed a lot of their numbers well over the last two weeks three weeks that a really a lot of really good matchups um this month in june they've just been fantastic this has popped their wrc plus all the way up to 115 because they are not just hitting the ball over the wall anymore it's it's down the line it's in a gap and they're hitting efficiently and they're really circling the base pass turning the lineup over so it's been all of them recently and that makes this lineup super super difficult to go after now when they're all hitting for average right 262 average in aggregate here against right-handers now this is up several percentage points over the last three weeks Um, that makes them incredibly difficult to go after 36 percent hard contact 203 iso these are going to be the best numbers of the day of course um outside of big like texas right so it's going to make it really hard to play sunday gray i think at this particular price tag and certainly at this projection however braves are still right-handed heavy right they've got uh probably three lefty four lefties in the lineup they have moved ozzy Albies back up into the two hole since he's been seeing the baseball recently matt olson's been kind of on a tear um over the last couple of weeks eddie has as well uh has has seen his price pop all the way up to 3,800 now uh, from his early season numbers where he was in the mid 2000s. And you've got Michael Harris, of course, down at the bottom of the lineup as well. From the left side, that's mostly where, from a contact perspective, how we'd like to attack, right? 17% K rate for Sonny. Unfortunately for lefties, he's got, he's still got a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball. Um, not giving up any hard contact to the left side really at all 25 percent there no power a little bit of average but good suppression metrics overall to the lefties and to the right handers doesn't give up any production here really either 225 average 276 woba and an 071 iso with a 31 percent strikeout rate 35 percent hard contact a little notable here because he's just on a line at about a buck 15 ground ball per fly ball with an elevated 24 percent line drive rate so he's more attackable in terms of contact with right handers but you still got to get get through a 31 percent strikeout rate so i think this actually puts him in play because the braves are going to go so right-handed heavy now some of these righties over here will still strike out cunha will still strike out a little bit not so much this season in aggregate the team only striking out you know sub 22 percent now this is just falling off a cliff this used to be at 23 and a half 25 percent earlier in the season this is how good they've been in the last you know month and a half 50 and 27 now um you know i believe this is the best record of the national league if it's not i'd be shocked so super difficult to get through them in terms of aggregate strikeout rate, but there's some attack ability here, right? Matt Olson's still going to strike out from the left side a little bit, um, right? Austin Riley will strike out a, a little, as will uh, Acuna at the top. Um, Marcelo Suna hovering about 20% himself. Same thing with Sean Murphy, you know, so not terribly attackable here, but Sonny Gray does still have 31% himself. So the walks are a little bit concerning here. The hard contact to the right side with the roughly neutral ground ball to fly ball, that does worry me a little bit. And some regression coming to him. Low strikeout rate to the left side. Braves are far more balanced now. That really takes me off of Sonny Gray uh, for the most part. But the ownership here really does kind of put me back on. I think it's an okay spot to punt in tournaments at 96 don't get me wrong i think he's overpriced for this particular matchup um but the ownership is kind of accounting for that here and i think this is a winnable spot this projection looks quite low uh, on a median basis at the moment here i think this is probably a a few ticks low Uh, but we do need sunny gray to go deeper into games so that is a worry and staying off of outsized exposures of sunny gray is, is probably pretty warranted here i think but um, getting a little bit and perhaps even getting some leverage on the field here with 10% of, of your of your teams 
I don't think this is bad at all because nobody's going to be playing Sonny here. And he's still one of the better arms on the slate. Uh, so I think that's perfectly warranted. We could get through Spencer Strider here really quick. Uh, we're not going to be playing any of the two. At least I'm not. Um, if you want, I know Spencer Strider over the last three, four starts or whatever, he's given up a couple real crooked numbers. Gave up five to the Mets, um, eight to Detroit, or, or some, something just ridiculous. He's given up a, a couple of spots here. Um, however, his last start, I believe, was pretty equitable. Kind of got back into the swing of things here. And really the only thing that's going to prevent us getting to a lot of Spencer Strider here, um, it mostly is the price tag. I don't think it's the ownership necessarily. The price tag is actually going to keep that number down. So um, I've still got no problems going after Strider. He does need this, this third pitch. He's throwing it a little bit more now, which is encouraging. And if it, it, out of a 8 10% usage pitch, if he can eke out roughly equal value, or roughly neutral value, I should say, relative to league average, I'm okay with that as long as he's got three pitches. But if he's only going to work with the two, and as of right now, the four-seamer over his last several starts has not been very good, right? It's still just the slider that's getting all of the value for him. If he's only got the two pitches, that's going to allow teams on the other side, no matter who you are, whether you're the Mets, bad offense, Detroit, bad offense, or the Twins, bad offense, you can zero in on two pitches, even if they're 98+, plus, and a very hard slider here at 86+. plus. So... Um, he needs to use this third pitch, and I think that's a a viable spot here against the Twins. Against right-handers, striking out 27% clip. This is the highest number on the day, of course. They're going to hit for a little bit of pop, but for the most part, is a break-even creation offense. They're not going to they're not going to steal. They're not going to you know create offense necessarily. Um, so really, if you get to any of the twins here on a six-game slate, it's just in leverage stacks, and Hope Strider just gets blown apart again, and he doesn't throw the changeup at all. But if he does go to bat with, uh, you know, with all three pitches here tonight, with a respectable usage rate, then I think that, you know, we we need to probably get as much Strider as we can at the 12-6 price tag. But it is notable he's on the barrel here. Right? He's got to start locating this four-seamer a little bit better and staying out of the middle of the plate. This is what's been getting him beat up over the last couple of starts here. So um, still super efficient early in the count, throwing a lot of strikes, and it's not the strikeout stuff that we're worried about. Right, He definitely has the highest upside of anybody, um, but it's the barrel and the, and the location here. He needs more. You can't be a starting pitcher in baseball um, unless you're DeGrom, who can't stay healthy. Um with just two pitches, right? You need a third pitch. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have some clunkers every now and then, and that's what Strider's kind of running into. But I've got no problems fundamentally outside of that. So give me all of the Strider as much as I can get. I'm probably just going to stay off of the Twins because uh, this offense is, is pretty bad um, overall. So I'd like to go after him, And that's kind of where I am. Kind of off of the Braves a little bit. They're still expensive, and if you want to go after Sonny Gray, I usually don't. I mean, it's okay. It's a six-game slate, and this is the most powerful offense outside of Texas. That's fine, I think. But, um, you know, for the most part, it's, it's going to be mostly pitching in that game for me. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and the Rangers. Matt Boyd on the mound, 6,200. I think this price tag is playable for him. The spot, I don't think is playable. Um, the Texas Rangers against lefties, 129 WRC+, plus, 21% strikeout rate, high walk rate here, pushing 10%, 175 ISO for them, 21% line drive rate with a neutral ground ball to fly ball. Otherwise, with 38% hard contact nearly. Uh, I, <laughs> Texas, I think, is, if you can make the price tags happen, the best stack of the day. Um, outside of, you know, like Seattle and and you know, Baltimore that we talked about earlier. Um, Numbers-wise, it, it's Texas uh, against lefties. Now, Matt Boyd has been serviceable quite a bit this season, really not super attackable. Um, he's still got a little bit of susceptibility to the right side, right? 33% hard with 080 ground ball to fly ball, right? Still gives up a little bit of pop here, 185 ISO. But a 185 ISO is not like 213 or 215, for example, Um that Andrew Heaney's giving up on the other side, or the 275 that the couple lefties in the Baltimore game uh, are giving up, right? 
So this split adjusted ISO 185 is actually a pretty respectable figure. 267 average, he'll give it up there a little bit with his 341 Woba giving it up there a little bit. So it's not like he is elite against right-handers in the opposite side, but he does have a little bit of whiff stuff that does keep them off the board a little bit. In aggregate, 24% K rate here, 8% walk rate's fine, 64% strike one, it's really good, 33% chase rate, pretty damn good also. He's got an ERA at about 540 with some expected metrics, about a run lower than that with a super low strand rate here. So at a, a low price tag, right, 6,200 and very low ownership on a six-game slate, he is in play. I'm going to stay off of it because I respect the Rangers offense, certainly at their home ballpark, way too much. They average like six and a half runs a game there. And this is, I mean, like we went over, I mean, 38% hard contact and a 130 WRC+. plus. These guys do steal bases. They do create. They hit the baseball over the wall. Incredibly difficult to, to get through this lineup in particular. Um, so I'm going to probably stay mostly off of Matt Boyd. If he were cheaper, I'd, I'd be more interested, of course. But the fundamental spot is overall pretty bad. If you land on a few of these teams in deep tournament stuff, I don't think this is horrendous because it's only a six-game slate. Uh, and Texas will carry a little bit of ownership. So I, I think he's in play in that respect. But for the most part, I just want to get to some Texas here where I can, uh, where they're well-priced. And unfortunately, most of them are not well-priced, right? Semi in 61, Seager 62, Josh Young at 47, Garcia in the outfield at 57. Like, these guys are not cheap. Jonah Heim behind the plate is 45, even though he's got really good numbers against lefties. Um, Zeke Duran, he's probably price-adjusted my favorite play at 3,400. Really good numbers against lefties for him. You can play Garver or Leoti, of course, down at the bottom of the lineup. But every damn one of these guys is super equitable in the batter's box, and that really is what takes me off of Matt Boyd for the most part. So I'll probably leave, end up leaving him on the shelf, try and stay in the upper range with most of my pitching today. Um, but if I had to get down here, I think I'm most comfortable stuff-wise playing Matt Boyd, but I'm not going to do it because he has the worst matchup of all of these cheap guys. On the other side, Andrew Heaney, he's in the mid-range at 8,000. I think he's very much playable. This is Detroit, right? But, I mean, Detroit against lefties, they're not nearly as bad as you would assume, right? 94 WRC plus here. That's a pretty respectable figure. 9.5% walk rate, really respectable. 22.5% K rate. This is average. 157 ISO, it's slightly above average. As a matter of fact, with this, look at this number, 37% hard contact against left-handers this season. They've been very much serviceable, and I think Detroit is... Well, they're super cheap, number one. Um, there is not a single guy outside of Javi... Hadavi... Okay, there's two guys. Javi Baez and Spencer Torkelson. Tork is 3,300, right? And Javi Baez is 3,900. Everybody else is 3K or, or less. And it's usually pretty warranted. Their numbers are not all that great, right? They hit a lot of ground balls, and they don't make a lot of hard contact necessarily. Power numbers not really there individually, you know, for the most part, a lot of them are hovering right around this 150 ISO range, give or take. So it's not a, a super thrilling offense, but on a six-game slate, that very much puts them in play because Andrew Heaney's still going to see his typical 25% ownership, give or take. He's at a playable price tag. He's got the strikeout stuff, of course. They're going to go right-handed heavy, though, here and probably have very few lefties, if anybody, in the lineup tonight. And that's obviously the downside of the platoon for Heaney, right? 249 average allowed. That's a fine number. 345 Woba starting to get a little bit elevated. 215 ISO with a 23% K rate. Obviously, he's much better in the in the whiff stuff against the left side. 23% K rate is average. And the Tigers striking out at an above average from an offensive perspective. Above average clip. 085 ground ball to fly ball here for Heaney. A lot of fly balls and still some 36% hard contact, right? So that's attackable. And if you want to play some of these very cheap Detroit pieces, I think this is perfectly viable, getting a little bit of leverage on the field. And I think the spot is fine, too. Fundamentally, he's still giving up pop in the air. 10% barrel rate, 10% walk rate, 1.8 homers per nine to the lefties. Still hasn't totally figured it out, even though he's throwing his changeup a hell of a lot more this season. 
overall a break-even arsenal, and he's actually losing a lot of this value on the slider now and the change too. So with a break-even four-seamer and declining value in the changeup of the slider, Andrew Heaney is looking to be regressing a little bit to the old Andrew Heaney ways, giving up a decent bit of pop here to opposite-handed hitters. So I think he's very much attackable with some super cheap pieces from Detroit. Zach Short leading off. He's got really good numbers against lefties in a short sample this year. Torque does as well, uh, even though he doesn't hit for a lot of average. He still has some pop. Doesn't strike out a ton. Andy Abanya has really good numbers against lefties this season. Dual eligibility at 2,500. He'll likely be in the three-hole. Javi Baez stinks. Strikes out way too much. Has a nearly 50% chase rate. And doesn't have any power this season. So I'd probably just stay off of him, even if I'm stacking Detroit. Because there's other shortstops that are better hitters and aren't going to strike out nearly as much. So I'd probably stay off of him. Eric Haas didn't have any power, but he's a cheap you know, five-hole catcher piece if you want to get there. Matt Veerling does have some pretty good numbers against lefties. Guys down at the bottom of the lineup, Miggy, Johnny Scope, Jake Marisnik has historically got decent numbers against lefties, but overall pretty underwhelming down at the bottom. So I'd like to mostly stick to the top half where I get to some Tigers, but I think they're very much in play targeting Andrew Heaney here. So I think offense mostly for me, but I do think of course, getting some Andrew Heaney pieces against a, a low upside offense in general and a below average offense relative to league average, at least 94 WRC plus, um, you know, that's that's still attackable with somebody that does have some whiffs in the tank on the mound. And he's at a playable price tag and what I think is on a six game slate, a playable ownership figure. So don't have really any problem getting to a little bit of Heaney. If I had to build teams right now, I'd probably come in under and play some Detroit on the other side. And certainly some Texas uh, against Matt Boyd. So that's how I'd mostly like to approach it. Favorites have got to be like Texas, then maybe the Tigers, I think, then Heaney, then Boyd. Um, but I think pretty much everybody is here is in play in some respect or another. Okay, let's move on. White Sox and the Angels. Interesting pitching matchup here as well. Dylan Cease, 7700 This is a playable price tag. Now, I talk about this every start with Dylan Cease. The walks are still a problem. He still can't get right-handers out. He has a 13% walk rate there with a 45% hard contact rate. Um, and kind of unimpressive buck 25 ground ball to fly ball. So that hard contact rate is way too high if you don't have, what, north of two ground balls per fly ball um, to keep you out of trouble here so he's walking righties and he's given up way too much hard contact to them for my liking it st still hasn't translated necessarily into a into a lot of power because he's still throwing it past them right still has the whiffs 32 33 percent carry to the righties so that would mostly take me off of a lot of the right-handed angels over here um you know high walk rate high strikeout rate that puts them in play in tournaments of course um like a, a Mike Trout, for example, he's going to walk a good bit. He's going to strike out a lot and he's going to hit for some power, right? So that puts these guys in play like Brandon Drury, for example, um, Taylor Ward, sure. Hunter Renfro as well. They're in play, but the high walk rate and high strikeout rates to the right side of the plate um, mostly kind of put me on to Dylan Cease here a little bit, even though I hate playing this guy. He walks way too many people, only goes five and a third per start. Um, you know, it's not that he's not efficient early in the count, it's that he can't throw a damn strike later in the count. Break even four seamer here, fine split. I wish he'd just throw it more. Break even slider and you know, relatively break even curveball as well. So he doesn't have anything all that impressive in the arsenal. Mechanics are still off, and he's still yanking the slider and the breaking pitches um, to the right side of the plate. And he could have a 40% strikeout rate strider territory if he would stay over the, the right leg a, a little bit more. And, and stay forward rather than leaning back into mechanics and, and yanking all of the breaking pitches. Uh, in any case, um, that would give him more control with the four-seamer as well, and you would see the strikeout rate to the left-handers tick up. No matter, he's still at just 22% here to the left side of the plate, and with decent velocity, um, these numbers are underwhelming to say the least. 
He's got a slightly more fly ball lean here with an 085 ground ball to fly ball to the left side as well. And line drive rates there, 24% to lefties, 21% to righties. So I think Dylan Cease is still attackable, of course. Angel's probably going to see a little bit of ownership here. I think they'll probably see too much. So I do think that at this particular price tag, Dylan Cease would be in play. Very, very high strikeout. They're going to be balanced, right? Righty, lefty. They'll have Shohei, Matt Thice, almost certainly. They'll either have Eddie Escobar, who they just picked up. Uh, they might have like a Mike Moustakas, who they also just picked up. Or Luis Renjifo. Um, all of those guys, of course, going to hit from the left side. So they'll be balanced there. And they'll probably have a, a Mickey Moniak in the lineup as well, who had a really good series in Colorado. Um so they'll be balanced, probably four lefties at least, and that puts them in play due to the contact rate that Cease is going to give up. Uh, and, of course, the righties are, are really not bad hitters, right? you got Trout, Drury, Hunter Renfro, uh, and a Taylor Ward, right? Maybe a David Fletcher in the middle infield. We'll see what they want to do. they got to have a, a lot of flexibility now uh, with their recent pickups. So I um, have to keep an eye on their lineup. And if they go very right-handed heavy, I think that puts Cease in play. If they go very left-handed heavy, that probably puts the Angels more in play, I think. Um, you know, if they're good left-handed hitters or respectable left-handed hitters, at least. So I think both sides are really in play here. But it seems, at least here in the early going, that the Angels are likely to be a little bit too popular. Um, you can always play Shohei. You can always play Trout. That's not really the issue it's the cheaper guys you know like the Matt Dice behind the plate etc that makes everything work that's probably going to elevate their ownership and perhaps a bit outside of their um you know their probabilistic success range so to speak so I think Cease is in play here and I do like sub 20 percent ownership on him you know relative to the other guys in this same range including Reed Detmers right he's at 19 percent as well he's 400 cheaper and I think he's also in play so both of these guys, I've dogged on pretty much all season. I hate playing them uh, because they've got hard contact figures that really worry me. And in particular for Reed Detmers, he's got a 30% line drive rate with an 075 ground ball to fly ball and 35% hard contact to right-handers. He does this. He's been doing this for a year and a half. I do not understand still how this is sustainable for Detmers. But he's got a 30% K rate, and he only gives up a 105 ISO to the right side. I don't get it. Um, so I think it puts him in play. I think you just got to kind of jump on board. However, the White Sox are also in play because this is a lefty with a line drive problem and a fly ball problem, and they're exceptionally right-handed heavy. Now, they're not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot. A couple of these guys will, right? Jake Berger, notably, he's going to strike out north of 30%. Luis Robert pushing 30% in a strikeout rate against lefties. Overall, though, you've got Eloy in there. Tim Anderson doesn't strike out at all. Andrew Vaughn, low strikeout rate against lefties, right? Uh, Andrew Benintendi doesn't strike out a whole hell of a lot against lefties. So overall, that kind of balances them right at an average clip. 23% K rate here. They're not going to walk, so they're going to make some contact. 165 ISO, it's about average. A little bit better. 32% hard contact, bad average. Some ground balls, though, and that's mostly elevated here by, like, a Tim Anderson, for example, who hits, the, at least this season, he's got five or six ground balls per fly ball against lefties. Of course, it's a short sample, but historically, he's always hit a lot of ground balls there. So uh, a couple of these guys are able to get the baseball in the air, like Luis Robert, Eloy Jimenez, Andrew Vaughn, and Jake Berger, when they can you know, make some solid contact. So I think this puts the White Sox in play as well. A 250 average, that's not nothing. That's um, a respectable figure here. They're going to be able to make a little bit of contact here, um, despite Reed Detmer's very high strikeout stuff to the right side. A couple of these lefties, if they even have lefties in the lineup, uh, it would likely just be Andrew Benintendi. Like I mentioned, he didn't strike out all that much. So it's an okay contact spot to kind of get the lineup going. See if they can get to Tim Anderson. We'll see if he'll even be in the lineup tonight. He's dealing with a bit of a sore right shoulder. So that could take you off of him a little bit as well. They've moved him over to second base the last few starts uh, in order to just get his bat in the lineup, uh, but save his right shoulder a little bit. Um, favorites here would probably be short stacks because of the very high strikeout rate to Detmers, but you can go after this and get leverage on the field, of course. 
Um, if I had to choose, I'd probably be Reed Detmers at 7300 I like the price tag for him. Um, but I think he's he's very much attackable with some White Sox here, with like a Tim Anderson, Luis Robert, Aloy Jimenez sort of stack. If you want to throw in an Andrew Vaughn and a Jake Berger, uh, he's definitely a tournament play. Strikes out a lot. But he's got all the power in the world, makes a lot of hard contact against lefties. Really good numbers there. Um, I think they're all in play. Grandal at 3,100. He's a playable catcher piece, for example, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think pretty much everybody is in play here. I think this is one of the games you're going to have to get right in tournaments tonight because I think there's playable spots. If I had to choose, it'd be the White Sox, right? And you're getting about a plus twenty in the betting markets right now. I don't think this is the worst play in the world, to be quite honest. So I think I'm going to have some White Sox, a little bit of Dylan Cease, probably some Reed Detmers too. And at least at the moment, staying off of a lot of the Angels outside of the, the natural Shohei Otani and Mike Trout sort of uh, plays. Okay, let's move on to the last game here, Washington-Seattle. Trevor Williams on the mound. He's going to make it really hard for me to play him. However, he's 5,800, right? This puts him in play, and he's been able to survive this year. And this is a pretty decent matchup for pretty much any right-hander in baseball against Seattle. 26% K rate. Seattle's going to be very popular once again. Um, and they probably should be, right? For the most part, Trevor Williams, very much attackable. 17.5% K rate. Not going to wow you with strikeout stuff. Definitely not to the left side. 12.5% there. 178 ISO allow with a 350 Woba and 293 average to the lefties. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. Just 29% hard contact, but there's a lot of contact for sure. To the right, he's very much attackable as well. 241 average allowed, 328 Woba and a 227 ISO. Strikeout stuff a little bit higher here, and this is what kind of puts him in play. He's got some stuff to keep them off the board a little bit because the hard contact numbers to both sides really not all that worrisome, even though there is a lot of contact at a full 83%. He's efficient early in the count with 63% strike one. He's got a little bit of chase in him at a 30% O swing rate. So despite the lack of strikeout stuff, and a lack of swinging strikes, and, and a really low CSW here at 24% for a starting pitcher. Overall, he's serviceable, right? Has a five-pitch mix. He's not going to go super deep into games, right? So you can't expect a lot of upside for him necessarily. But I would not be surprised, because Seattle is bad and pretty right-handed heavy themselves, if he can go a, a full six innings in this matchup here tonight. Um that puts him in play, and if you land on him at a 6.5% ownership here, I don't think this is bad. He's projecting the highest out of anybody in this you know, sub-6K range, so I think that puts him in play. He's certainly um, you know, the most savvy, I, su I should say, uh, of all of these guys down here under 6,000. Like, he's a veteran. You know, he's been around for a long time, and he knows how to pitch. Even though the stuff isn't overwhelming, uh, he still has enough in the tank to survive. So if you want to come off of some Seattle, I don't think this is bad necessarily. Uh, where they're, I mean, this is a six-game slate. Where they're expensive, like Julio, and even a little bit of a Jared Kelnick, uh, maybe a Cal Raleigh. You could come off of those pieces and play some other guys. That's not to say, however, that those guys are bad plays, right? They're they're going to pop really, really hard because J.P. Crawford, Ty France, Tay Oscar, 37. This is a pretty good spot for him tonight. Um, even Gino Suarez, he's going to make, a hopefully, a good bit of contact, even though he only hits 200 anymore and is dreadful against right-handers. All these guys are in certainly in play because Trevor Williams is going to pitch to so much contact in general, 83% there. So gives up some balls in the air and a good bit of pop, right? 12% barrel rate. It's worrisome, definitely. We're not going to get enthused about pro playing Trevor Williams or fading Seattle, necessarily. Um, so I think having exposure really to both sides here, Seattle, and maybe a little bit of Trevor Williams, is probably pretty warranted. Luis Castillo on the mound, 11000 It's a price tag for him that's going to keep us off. Um, but good news, that's going to keep his ownership down relative to Strider. He's efficient early in the count. He's got good chase, obviously good swinging strike rates, 30% CSW. For the most part, the only flaw for Castillo here is this changeup. It's getting worse, now giving up a full out and a half to the field down, still throwing it at 15% of the usage here. Um, that's leading to the 206 ISO 
and the production to the left side of the plate, much higher than to righty. So the Nationals here, they're not going to strike out a lot, even though Castillo's got a lot of really good suppression upside in this particular matchup. He could very easily go seven or eight innings tonight because this offense just doesn't create, but they don't strike out. So I would not be surprised at an elevated price tag to see a sort of underwhelming strikeout performance from Castillo tonight. they got a lot of lefties that they can go to work with here. Uh, Luis Garcia, Jamer from the left side, Corey Dickerson doesn't really strike out. And then, of course, they've got, like, you know, the low upside guys, Dom Smith, C.J. Abrams down at the bottom. Um, but they've got some lefties here that can make it a little bit difficult. And the right-handers, they're still going to hit for a little bit of average, even though maybe not so much power. Lane Thomas, Joey Manessis, Caber Ruiz in particular. Caber doesn't strike out at all, right? Um, and he does hit from the left side as well. So a little bit of a difficult strikeout matchup here, certainly. And it's, you know, it's not surprising to us. 18.5% K rate. They're not going to hit for power or create a whole hell of a lot. A lot of ground balls here, buck 50 in aggregate. But that's an okay batted ball matchup for some of these Washington pieces. If you want to mix in some of these and get some leverage on on this 25 and 30% ownership that Luis Castillo is going to see, I think that's a playable construction. Um, but I have got no problem fundamentally playing Castillo tonight. If I can't get all the way up to Strider, I'm fine dropping down to Castillo. Um, I would probably come in under here because I think the strikeout upside for Strider tonight is just far, far higher than it is for Castillo. But, um, you know, totally fading Castillo, I think, is... Uh, not the greatest idea. So I think pretty much everybody is in play here. I, I do like Seattle, of course, against Trevor Williams. Um, if I got to choose, it's it's probably the Mariners and Castillo sort of one in one A, right? Then Washington, then Trevor Williams. But I think everybody's pretty much in play here to uh, to one degree or another. It is just a six game slate. All right, so that's it for the breakdown. I think we kind of went long today here, so let's quickly go over a review. I do like offense here in this early game. Probably going to stay off of most of the pitching, um, even though their price tags do put these guys in play. I do like getting to some Baltimore stacks where I can. They're much better priced than Cincinnati, who is expensive. Um, that'll keep their ownership down a little bit here. But I think this is a very attackable spot against Cole Irvin. Uh, Milwaukee and the Mets, I'm pretty much off of Milwaukee mostly, which is going to put me onto a lot of Verlander, I think, um, which is kind of gulpy. I, I do think a couple of these guys, uh, like a Willie Adamas or a, a Yelich in particular, are well-priced and, and certainly playable. Perhaps a Rowdy as, as well, maybe a Willie Contreras, something like that. Having a little bit of exposure here if you're, if you're building a lot of teams, I think is warranted with Milwaukee, but... Um, you know, for the most part, probably off of their offense. It is really, really cold right now. Colin Ray, for them, I'm probably staying off as well. Um, even though this is a bad offense over here from the Mets. You know, pretty much everybody in play here um, at uh, at some sort of, whether it's a price tag or a fundamental spot or anything like that. But I think there's a lot of playable spots in that game. Minnesota and Atlanta, mostly just pitching here for me. I'm going to stay off of Minnesota pretty much entirely, um, outside of maybe a deep tournament sort of leverage stack against my very likely heavy Strider ownership. And I'm going to try and get as much Strider as I can. I think it's a really, really good spot for him to kind of uh, get off the schneid and reestablish with the change up here. Um, Atlanta, I'm not really interested in, to be honest. I think Sonny Gray is very much in play. Detroit, I, I kind of like here against Andrew Heaney. They create a little bit, and they've got some good numbers against lefties. Heaney, on the, of course, he's in play. He's got strikeout stuff, um, and he's always in play in tournaments. But I'd probably come in under the, his current ownership. Matt Boyd, same thing with him. Not jacked about the price tag. Um, I'd wish it if he were a little bit cheaper, and, he'd, and if he didn't get Texas on the other side. So I'm just going to stack Texas here uh, where I can. Um, maybe have a little bit of Matt Boyd, though, as, as some coverage on the other side, just in case. White Sox-Angels, really interesting tournament game here. Uh, I think everybody is in play, really top to bottom. Um, favorite might probably be Dylan Cease. I don't know. It's probably the White Sox, then Dylan Cease. But uh, I think everybody's in play. And Washington and Seattle, as we just talked about. Um, some Washington pieces where they're well-priced. 
from the left side of the plate mostly, like a Luis Garcia, Corey Dickerson perhaps, but Castillo for sure because he could throw eight innings here tonight. Um, really no problem. And some Seattle. I do like Kelnick, of course. I do like uh, Cal Raleigh. And even a little bit of J.P. Crawford up at the top. But the righty is very much in play also because Trevor Williams gives it up to both sides. So that's it for the breakdown. Um, it's kind of where I stand so far. We do have ownership and projections loaded to the site already. So keep an eye out for those as lineups start rolling in. We'll have updates um, all throughout the day. So good luck to everybody here on this uh, Monday Six Gamer.